Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible.
we come to you requesting your guidance, your wisdom, and support as we worship you. May we recognize the love and peace you have given to us through your Son, Jesus Christ. Guide the spirit in our hearts and our minds to gain strength and understanding of your will as we hear your word today. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Good morning. How are y'all doing this morning? If you look around, you'll see us. We have a lot of people on vacation. You know, are y'all excited about going to vacation and getting to do some of that this summer? It's kind of nice to have a little change of pace, do something a little bit different, don't you think? That's cool. Well, I spent part of last week with my buddy Derek, and we were riding, we rode almost 400 miles last week on a bicycle which was uh, an interesting part of vacation, don't you think? That's a, that's a long way on a bicycle. I don't want to ride a bicycle for a little while. I'm, I've, seen, I've seen enough bicycle for a while. But let me tell you something I thought about. I thought about that vacation is to make us change what we do on a regular basis. You know, y'all have been really busy with school. You've been doing your homework and all of that. It's kind of nice to sleep a little later in the morning or or have a little bit of a change. Y'all were in vacation Bible school last week, and you had a chance to do something different. It's different from Sunday school. It's different from the way you do things there. And you'll probably go off with your families and do something different, or you can go swim in the middle of the afternoon where normally you'd be in school. So you get to do things in a different way and see things in a different way. When you're on a bicycle riding... You know, we're always closed up in cars and we don't get to hear a lot of things or see a lot of things. But guess what? I heard cows mooing and I heard chickens and I smelled chickens. And I saw, I got to see things I haven't seen in a good while because everything changed there for a little while. Jesus taught us that there are times in our lives when we need to stop what we're doing and do something in a different way. That's why we come to the Lord's table and we have the Lord's Supper. He says, every time you do this, you're remembering me. Every time you do this, you're thinking about something that, that I did for you. And he said, so that's a change of pace, something a little bit different. So it's not just coming in and singing the hymns and listening to a sermon and going home. It's drawing a little bit closer to him, thinking about what he did for us in a different way. So I want you today to think about how Jesus loves us. We've sung that. About how Jesus loves the little children. That's another song we've sung. And we think about how we love Jesus because we just sang the hymn that says, I love thee, I love thee. So we know God loves all of us. He has a special place in his heart for children. And we have a special place in our heart for him. And that's what helps us understand things in a little different way. It's okay. It's perfectly all right. It's one of God's children, and Jesus would have enjoyed that particularly. Let's have a prayer together, and let's thank God for times that we can be doing things in a little bit different way. Okay? Let's have a prayer. Dear God, we love you so much. You love us so much, and we enjoy that love. It's what gives us a chance to be different sometimes. Do things in a different way. To have a summer vacation and get out of the normal routine and do something in a special way. And then look forward to getting back to the other things later. So help us in our relationship with you never to make two days exactly the same. But to think about how you show us new and different things. Beautiful things within your world. Thank you for these boys and girls. Thank you for the goodness of their lives and their hearts. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Some things take us to just a little bit different place. And I invite you to go with me to that place of worship where, from your hearts, think about how God gives you the opportunity to refresh, to restore, and to do something that makes this world a bit different because of what he has given you in that moment. Would you bow with me as we pray? O Lord of care and love, of restoration and spirit, of encouragement and hope, and of peace, we come before you and we ask that we be instruments of that peace within your world. As we will hear, may we sense that heart song that you have, that song that draws us together and makes us community. We can come from scattered places, we can find a common purpose, and in you we become one. So as we gather at your table, remind us of what that oneness means and where it takes us. And help us as your people to be people of faith and encouragement. So as you give us that strength, then send us to the places where we need to be. Because there are people who are suffering and we need to be there with them. And there are people who are lonely and we need to be there for them. There are people who are filled with joy, filled with disappointment, filled with, with guilt or filled with a sense of purpose. And in every one of those lives there's some word that needs to be spoken for you, for them. So give us the words... Give us the spirit, give us the opportunity, and may we give to you our willing hearts. Thank you for drawing us into this place. Help us to be instruments of your love. In the name of Jesus, amen.
Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for today. And thank you for the love that you show us each and every day, every moment of every hour. And dear God, please continue to fill our hearts with love and help us to share that love with others. And please bless the tithes and offerings. Help us to be good stewards of what you've given us and help us to use it as your will is. Your will be done, and in your name we pray. Amen. One of the most refreshing spots in Columbus, Georgia, right here on the banks of the Chattahoochee. It reminds me of what it feels like in worship at First Baptist Church. Familiar hymns, a sermon, other people who share the love of Jesus in that beautiful place. I'd like to invite you to come visit us at First Baptist Church in beautiful uptown Columbus and see just how refreshing worship can be and how much love people can give. First Baptist Church, doing worship and hospitality by the book. Good morning. Welcome to worship with our First Baptist Church family here in beautiful uptown Columbus, Georgia. I am so glad you've come to worship with us, even by way of television. Uh, there are a lot of reasons that you would be on that side of the screen. And I'm just glad you're a part of our celebration of God's love and His grace today. It's my prayer that you will feel the Spirit's movement. Today is Communion Day. We will be sharing the Lord's Supper together. And even uh, distanced by this electronic medium, you have the opportunity to feel the Spirit's movement and to remember, along with all the rest of us, the gift of God's love, His sacrifice, and His salvation. Thank you for being a part. And if you have prayer requests, things that we may do to help minister in your life, then please let us know. Thank you for the gift of our being together. And may God bless you on this day, this very, very holy day. Thank you. The passage of scripture this morning that we're using as our text is from 2 Corinthians chapter 13, beginning with the 11th verse. 2 Corinthians 13, beginning with verse 11. What I want us to think about is how Christ does call us apart and draw us closer to uh, Him in a moment like this, in a communion experience. I was talking about, and I'll talk more about it other times, but when you go off and you do what we did last week, and you go on a bicycle and you have people from all over the place together, there's a common place you're going. 
But as you gather in the different places, you begin to build relationships. You begin to build community in some way or another. It doesn't mean any of us are alike. It doesn't mean any of us are from the same place. It doesn't mean we'll ever be from the same place. All it means is that there are certain things within our lives that draw us together and grant to us a peace and a community that's pretty powerful and pretty well bonding of lives together. And so that's how friendships begin. That's how relationships begin. And that's how people find fulfillment in some things within their lives. Paul calls upon the Christians at Corinth to find this kind of community. Now, in a lot of cases, when we read the Corinthian correspondence, we think about conflicts within that area and the the problems that the Christians were going through and what they had to work on and how they had to develop that basic relationship. I want us to take it to a different level and think about it in terms of of God calling them into a relationship with Him and calling them into a closeness with God and a more intimate experience. Almost like we talk about vacation changes the pace and you go do something different. Or when gatherings, family gatherings come together and you kind of push aside all of the other concerns and you just enjoy being together. Listen to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 13. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. He begins with this idea of happiness and of kind of a release into a world that is freer from worry and freer from frustration because he says just relax and rejoice in a day that God has given to you and find that peace. That's the foundation of what he's saying. Then he says, in the middle of that, Strive for full restoration. Now, let's think about restoration in a different way than we do in our world right now. where We're always trying to get people to settle conflicts and get over problems and begin to agree with each other and all of that. Let's take it to a little bit different level. If I am restored, if I am refreshed, I have resourced myself to have something to offer to you. If I'm well rested, then out of the energy of my rest, I can come and bless your life in some way or another. So let's just say that, for the sake of my argument at this point, let's say that Paul is telling the Christians there, begin with rejoicing as your foundation, then seek a personal restoration. Sabbath, prayer, reading the Scripture, Taking a nap. I don't care what it is. Whatever it is that seems to restore you at this point, allow that to happen. And notice where he takes the restoration. He says, out of that, look at the next couple of three words. Encourage one another. Once I'm restored, I have a different perspective on life. And out of that perspective, I can look at you and say, well, I can give you some encouragement because... I know how God is working in this moment, and I feel the refreshing of His Spirit. Okay, and once you have encouraged someone else, what's the next step? Paul gives you that. Be of one mind. It doesn't mean that we have to compromise. It doesn't mean that we have to give up everything. What it means is that we find that common ground. What is it that would be the basis of a relationship with someone else? From the joy, to the restoration, to a word of encouragement where I offer something to you. And out of that, we begin to find that common ground that says, Hey, I like this person. I think we could have a relationship together. And then Paul takes it to the next step and gives you the result. Out of that, we begin to live in peace. Imagine a world where we do that, where we find the good in the world and we say, I can rejoice in the blessings that God has given and feel the joy of that, that sunshine of His joy. Out of that, I can work for my own restoration. I know where my weaknesses are and where I need to kind of be restored, fixed, repaired, strengthened, helped, so I'm going to get that worked out. 
And then out of that, I'm going to say, look, it worked for me. Let me tell you how it can work for you. I will coach you, encourage you, cheer you on to finding how your own restoration comes. I will be your encourager. And out of that, we will find that common ground of relationship. And out of that, we'll begin to live in peace. And then he says, this caps it, and the God of love and peace will be with you. By the time you work through all of the things that Paul is talking about, at the end of it you see that he is showing us the path for a good relationship with God. And it begins with rejoicing, works to our own improvement, moves to doing something that encourages someone else and brings them along the journey. Then once we're walking together, we find that peace. And out of that peace, we find that it really has had its genesis in the love and peace of God's presence. Now, when I read this, I read this for years. Think of the power of that within our lives. Then Paul turns and says, greet one another with a holy kiss. Now, I'm not recommending that in here today. So, it may go over well, it may not go over well. It just depends. I had a friend one time who was a member of uh, St. Philip's in Atlanta, and the priest got up one Sunday and told the congregation, he said, greet everyone with a holy kiss. And he saw one guy coming straight at him, and, he, and the guy said, the peace of the Lord be with you. And my friend was very much to himself a boundary kind of guy, and he put up his hand and said, same, same. He didn't want him to get any closer than that. <laughs> so sometimes we're not comfortable with a holy kiss, maybe. But he says then in verse 13, look what he says. All God's people here send their greetings. Now he's established the fact that we're part of a larger family, a larger community. It's not just what's happening in my life, how I encourage you, how we become of one mind, and we find that. But there is a larger community out there that also shares in that. So Paul says, all of us are cheering you on. How are they doing it? Through their own restoration, through their encouraging words, through their oneness of mind, and through their living in peace. This is a powerful image that draws us to this table. When I was growing up, we, we heard, they would often take secular songs and would uh, emphasize things in our youth groups and they would take out parts of it and leave in parts of it. And one of the songs when I was growing up that kind of awakened me to this idea of this greater intimacy was a George Harrison song. You remember the My Sweet Lord? You remember that? Yeah, y'all are grinning. You do know that one. And, um, but when I read the words that, that I use out of this, it's basically like a prayer song. It's basically calling us into a removing of the distractions from around us and focusing on this Lord. My sweet Lord, oh my Lord, my Lord, I really want to see you. I really want to be with you. I really want to see you, Lord, but it takes so long, my Lord. My sweet Lord, my Lord, my Lord. I really want to know you, really want to go with you, really want to show you, Lord, that it won't take long, my Lord. And as I was growing up, we used that in the youth group, appropriately or inappropriately, but the point was, it helped us understand that the relationship with Christ was one that was one-on-one. -on -one. And that the searching of the human soul, I want to know you, I want to be with you, I want to experience this with you, drew us into at least the excitement of saying, you mean I can know my God that closely? And when I was thinking about today, that's precisely what Jesus is teaching us. It resembles that prayer song to me, it captures the timbre of the night when Jesus and His disciples were there together in that upper room. Every time I read that passage, something else stands out. Something was happening for sure, and the disciples needed to hear the Lord because there was a foreboding atmosphere within the room for sure. The night had to have been heavy. 
And they wanted to know some of the subject. Some of the subject matter would have been heavy in the conversation. But the disciples ultimately wanted to be with Jesus, wanted to know Jesus, and wanted to see Him in His glory. But it would take patience. But it takes so long, my Lord. Now it was about to accelerate, and they had no idea how it was, but Jesus slowed the evening down. He says, restore yourself. Encourage each other. Begin to take that and find that oneness of mind here, regardless of anything else you disagree on or any other places that you have conflict. Find that oneness of mind when you sit at this table together. And out of that, you will live in peace, and then that peace and love of God will come and wash over you. If the heart song of humanity was expressed that evening in wanting to see and know and be with Christ, then you sense how the conversation drew that song out. Is it I? Am I the one who's betraying you? Not pointing fingers at someone else. Are you going to wash my feet? You mean you're going to wash my feet? It draws out that unworthiness, that sense of humility. What does all this mean? The old traditional Passover question. What's, why is this night different from the rest? Drawing out that same question there. And out of that search, that's when the disciples found what intimacy with Christ was about. In Psalm 8, the psalmist kind of captures this and he wells up. He has a moment that is like a revelatory moment. He sees something he hasn't seen before. I'm telling you, when you're on the bicycle, when you're riding along, away from interstate highways where you've spent so much time with all the windows up and everything closed in and sitting there, you don't hear anything, you don't see anything except maybe music blaring from the radio. When you're just riding along, you see things and smell things and, and are able to experience things and hear things that you don't normally do. And Jesus called to that. And the psalmist sensed that in his life way before Jesus. In Psalm 8 he says, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Isn't that the praise? You've set your glory above the heavens. The praise of children and infants you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. Where is power? It's not in might. It's not in how much you can build up. Power is in the praise of children. A child can turn a heart in a heartbeat. And a child captured the very heart and mind of Jesus. Suffer the little children to come unto me. Then the psalmist waxes a little bit philosophical. He says, when I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars which you've set in place, what is mankind that you're mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them, you've made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You've made them rulers over the works of your hands, put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and animals the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, all that swim in the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. What made the name majestic is not that the psalmist said it. It is the recognition of who God is that made the psalm have meaning. What delighted God the most? It was the praise of the children. It was the praise of others. That's where God found the delight. And it is that there that the common mind came about. So the disciples are putting into context their relationship with Jesus. They saw that public Jesus who would get out and preach and teach and do the miracles. But they saw that part of Jesus in the private world where Jesus did things the right way. It takes so long, my Lord. Think about it. If you see a shepherd dealing with sheep or somebody who has horses dealing with something that's gotten into the hoof, or you see somebody taking care of uh, an animal that they have or something, you notice how gentle they are. 
if a sheep gets caught in briars, you don't go just yank the sheep out. What do you do? You go and you look at it. You try to calm the sheep. You untangle bit by bit. You prick your own fingers while you're doing it, but you're just trying not to hurt that sheep anymore. If you're dealing with your dog or if you're dealing with, with another animal or something, you do the same thing. You calm them. You examine them. You gently begin to work it out. You don't go in roughshod. It takes long for that to happen. And Christ taught at that table, it takes a while for you to grasp all of this. But it's going to happen, and I'm going to untangle you from the briars of sin and the briars that absolutely prick you every way you turn. That's why Malachi, uh, Micah said that what God wants from us is to act justly, to love mercy, and walk humbly with God. That's the way the relationship plays out. And Paul captured it. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for full re restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the love and peace of God will be with you. Years and years ago, and I started thinking about when my happiest moments were, when the times I felt this closeness beginning to develop. My mom was one of those people who always thought everybody always was supposed to be at peace. Everybody was to be at peace no matter what. There could be no arguments, no conflicts. Everything had to be at peace. To this day, if our family gets together, we're sitting, having dinner, somebody will say, Mom will be really happy to know that we're all getting along really well. I mean, that's just kind of the attitude there. But I found that sense of peace in the life of a person with whom I worked. She and I worked together for a number of years. She was like a grandmother to my kids. She was like a, another mother to Roxanne and me. We were so young in that particular church. And she was one of those people you could go to, sit down, get advice, listen to. She would guide you. She kind of protected you along the way. But she also was one who came to me one day and said that she had, con had been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And we went through all the denials and all of that, and we worked our way through it. And I watched her. She'd get better, and she'd get worse. She'd end up in the hospital, then she'd get to come out, then she'd come back to work and whatever. And so we just kind of worked together on it as I watched her walk through that difficult time. But I'll never forget the day I walked in the hospital and she was lying in bed, and as I walked in, she said, Today we have to talk. And I said, Okay. I said, I think we probably do. And she had known, she knew at this point, that she was at the end of the road. She wasn't going to make it. It was time to talk. And in those moments, she had spiritually so restored herself that in her weakest moment physically, she had a lot to offer. And she said, it's not going to be easy. She knew on me. And so I pulled up a chair and we sat down and she said, let's just talk. And she said, now, this is going to be over soon. I'm going to be okay. My faith is where it ought to be. I know where I'm going. She said, you're going to be okay too. And it was interesting, when I look at what Paul said, how her pattern fit what Paul did, she was personally restored, and then she turned to encourage me. She said, you know, you're young, but you're, you do good in what you're doing. You're going to grow in what you're doing. You're going to do well. And she said, I'm sorry I won't be here to see it, but I'll be watching from where I am. And in the oneness of mind, she actually let me come in to where she was in her dying days. And she let me be a part of knowing how she felt and experienced. And so we came to one mind, and we came to a sense of peace. And the miracle, the miracle, was not that I walked in one day and she said, well, I'm well, I've had this miracle to change. The miracle was that God's love and God's peace so covered us that we could say the goodbyes we needed to 
and could walk the rest of the journey without any kind of fear, hers or mine. It was a beautiful moment. And when I read this, I thought, you know, that's where I saw it first before I ever even read it in the Scripture. You find your restoration. You encourage someone else. You find that oneness of mind. You live in peace. And then the blessing of God comes. That's what we do at the table. So in the moment now, restore yourselves. Encourage one another by sharing in this moment. Find the oneness of mind in that this is about nothing except celebrating Jesus and what Jesus has done for us in salvation. And then find God's peace and love just washing over you as you feel more intimate and you hear the heart song of God, which is a song of love, a beautiful song of love. Will you bow with me as we pray? Spirit of our precious Lord, draw us to your table. Draw us into this moment. Give us that oneness of mind and heart. And wash over us with your Spirit. Help us to feel intimacy with you and the true Spirit of your peace. In the name of Jesus, Amen. Caitlin Hedgecoat is here, right here. I'm going to reach over and hand this to you. Caitlin has been baptized into our fellowship, and this is her first communion with the church family since she has been baptized. And I want to hand her her handkerchief from her baptism as a celebration of this moment and welcome to this family in a special way. Caitlin, bless you, my dear. And I thought I saw Bill Montgomery... Bill? Maybe I didn't. Okay, we'll catch him later. John, come.
Jesus taught that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus came into the world as the Word. And the Word became flesh and began to dwell among us. And then at the end of Jesus' ministry, Jesus said, This is my body broken for you. The Word came to reveal God. The Word came to be broken to save us from our sins. This is the bread that came down out of heaven, not as the fathers ate and died. Whoever eats this bread, believing, will live forever. The body of Christ. Lord Christ, as we receive this gift, make us truly humble in our hearts. Receive from us the gratitude as we recognize what it means. And restore and refresh us so that we may encourage, find oneness of mind, and find your peace. In the name of Jesus, lead us now to your cup. Amen.
When we think of the cup of Christ, we think of the blood that was shed for us. It was done out of love. It was done out of mission and purpose. And it was offered freely with a love that was unconditional. The faith that we have in Jesus is what cleanses us because of his sacrifice of all of our sins. And so as we think about that gift, Jesus told his disciples, he said, drink this. This is my blood. This is the new covenant which is shed for you, the blood of Christ. At the end of the evening, the disciples sang a hymn and went out. And there are two parts to this. The first part is they came to this oneness of mind as they sat around the table Out of that, they found a peace with what would happen next. They weren't sure, but there was a peace. There was something that was at work there. It changed as time went on. But when they left that room, there was a oneness, just like there is a oneness with us. So from restoration to encouragement, to finding that oneness of mind, to the peace. And now the love and the grace of Christ pours over all of us. That's the gift of this moment, and I pray that you feel the intimacy of Christ's gift there. The hymn is 477. And then after that, as our, choral, as our benediction, we will sing together, Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love, reminding us that that's the ultimate result, the oneness of mind and heart, the wholeness of in Christ. So as we sing 477, think about what the Spirit is saying to you in this moment. If there are decisions to make, this is the time to do it. And I'll meet you at the front as we stand together and we sing. been at the Lord's table, we have a oneness of heart and mind, and we have a world that lies before us that needs the peace that God has poured upon each of you. So as you go, be that word of encouragement, draw them into the peace, that they may experience the fullness of God's grace. As a people, go forth. Go forth in love, and in grace, and in strength, and in courage, and in hope. In Christ, in whose name we pray, amen.